Thank you so much for that introduction, Hadley. It is such a pleasure to be here. Max and I are really excited to be talking to you today about machine learning and software for machine learning. The, this talk, the topic is not so much going to be about the math of statistical modeling or new methods for machine learning. What we want to talk to you here today about is applied machine learning. How you, as a map modeling practitioner, um, uh, get on that road, that road from model development through to model deployment. As we're here together and we, we you know, talk about being this road that we, we are on, we think this trip down this road is going to be better if we all go together. So we would encourage you to you know, oh, have Slido up on your phone with the event code rkeynote. And we're going to be um, using some polls during this talk to, for us in this room and people who are um, watching from afar, to be able to share their own experiences, opinions, and perspectives. So what we're going to be talking about today is the software that we build for machine learning. Um, and that is tidy models. So um, you can think of tidy models as a meta package that helps you install and manage other packages that are used for modeling and machine learning um, in R. These packages work together, but each have a specific focus. They, it works much the same way that the tidyverse does. So if you have ever typed library tidyverse and then used ggplot2 for data visualization, dplyr for data manipulation, you can think about tidy models as working in the same way. You type library tidy models, and then you have access to these different packages that have a focused purpose. So Yardstick, for example, is a package that is used to measure model performance. Tune, perhaps unsurprisingly, is a package for hyperparameter tuning. So this is a great way to think about tidy models, that it's an R package that gives you access to all these kinds of functions that work together. It's also right to be thinking about um, tidy models as a unified framework for modeling in R. The, the ecosystem for modeling in R is, is one, of it, one of our like, big strengths. It is a reason why people choose to use R. At the same time, it really presents a challenge because the interface to all these different kinds of models are very heterogeneous. If you have set up a model analysis using one kind of model, the moving over to a different type of model often involves starting over from scratch with your whole approach. Tidy Models provides a unified interface to um, a vast array of modeling approaches, feature engineering approaches, and encourages good statistical practice via its design. Now, some of you are sitting out there and you're thinking, wait a minute, R already has several of these. In fact, that person standing up there next to Julia talking right now is one of the people who has built one already. So, Max, what's going on? Why yet another modeling framework for R? Why would Max do this, right? So, uh, so I wrote a package uh, a while back called Carrot, and it's uh, another similar modeling framework. Um, and it was in 2005, which many of you know if you developed packages back then were a different time. Uh, there were no namespaces in R, for example, and it was lacking a lot of the things that we have now. I was also kind of doing it in my spare time, and it wasn't really engineered in a way that we could sort of port it over to uh, new and better interfaces and extend it really well. So, you know, learning more as I've gone on about software engineering, um, I think if I'd known those things back then, I would have done some things different under the hood. Um, so it's not really something that is really extendable at this point. But maybe more importantly, it's really not something that has a very, it's not a bad interface, but it's a very 2005 interface, where you have like one function that does just about everything and has like 30 options to it. So we were thinking about doing more and more with Carrot, it would be really difficult because, you know, if we add more uh, types of resampling or more preprocessors or this or that, then you have a function that has like maybe 100 or so options, which is not a good design. 
And so since 2005, I think we've not only learned a lot more about how to write a good R package, but we've learned a lot more about how people interact with our software a lot more. And then, you know, as time goes on, you see things that are happening in ggplot, even just plier and then dplyr and things like that. So I think we've learned, like as a community, a lot more about what are, what are good ways of writing interfaces and packages. And then as I started to think about that, I started to think about this in the context of modeling, and it seemed really like it would make sense to have more of like a tidy, modern interface to modeling. And so that's really the reason to build like a whole new uh, sort of stack from the, beginning, from the bottom up, because really what was old um, wasn't engineered well enough to extend, and also just its whole, its whole view of the world was not really very modern. So that's why we're going to do something different. So a lot of times we want to introduce software and, and talk about, let's say, our philosophy and why we do things. A lot of times we want to start off with a data set that we can use to illustrate things. So here's a data set uh, some of you have seen. It's Spotify data. So each row in this data frame is a track or a song. Um, we might want to do some modeling on this. This was uh, in a slice competition. The outcome is the popularity uh, column right there. That's a numeric. So we want to try to predict that with the other columns that are in this data set. Other interesting features, there's an, um, an artist feature. And as you might imagine, there are quite a large number of artists in the Spotify catalog. So we might think about ways we could deal with that when we go to do modeling. There's a date field. And we might not want to put date directly into a model. We might uh, be better off by deriving features from it, like an indicator for uh, month or year or any seasonality or any sort of like date-based features instead of using the original date value. And then we sort of have like this monster of a column over here, this character, and it's really like a multiple choice type field um, sort of in a delimited format. And what we'd like to do is we think that maybe genres are probably important to predict popularity, so we'd have to like deal with this data somehow. We'd have to find all the genres that are in the data, figure out how to encode them into our model matrix or the data we hand off to the model in a way that we could uh, make that work. And so there's this sort of like um, idea that we have of like what our modeling uh, script is going to look like. And you know, when we read books and we, we see websites and blogs and things like that, I think we're always led to believe that there's like this perfect data set that we're handed by our, our, um, our associates. And uh, there's like this single call to a modeling function. It's really clean and nice. And then you're going to make predictions. And it's just like a single line, and you're fine. It's no big deal. But the reality is more like this. It's like a Franken script. So you know, I, back when I used to do modeling, you know, I had a lot of scripts that I like to handle multiple choice values that I'd use across different projects and then different jobs and things like that. So I think this is more the reality of how most of our uh, modeling scripts look like. Um, and a lot of this is about the data pre-processing. So you know, at the top there, like we might use something like uh, a technique called effect encoding to handle the large number of artists. That requires some statistical estimation of the effect of each uh, artist. Um, you might do things like convert your, you know, all of us have like lubricate commands, right? That use like you know wday and all that to make date features that we then put in our model. Um, there's code there to parse the multiple choice field. And then at some point, we have way too many features, so we might think about doing some feature selection. And so there's this like, big script that we have to sort of do before we get to that actual line, one line of modeling. Um, so this is the reality of things, and it's not great. I mean, it's not something, if you do this for a living, you want to have to deal with every time you get a new data set. Now, we'll come back to that slide, and we'll also come back to this slide a couple times. And the point we want to make with this slide is, um, that we're doing, even before we get to the model, we're doing a lot of estimation and a lot of sort of like quasi-modeling work. So there are things here that we're estimating from a statistical standpoint. And also to say that when we go to predict new data, we have to apply all those same transformations to data we might get six months from now to make a prediction. So a good chunk of that, that sort of script on the last slide has to carry over to your other prediction um, script. Uh, and, and you have to keep using it. So it's a bit of a mess, and that's, as somebody who did this for a living, like this is a great problem to solve, and I think it's, it's probably pretty solvable. I really love this visualization of what you think your script is gonna look like and how it actually ends up turning out. It aligns so much with my practical experience, and that's why we wanna talk to you here about why Tidy Models is de um, designed the way it is and how it can um, support more ergonomic approaches to modeling. By ergonomic, what we mean here, that this is really about syntax, about how expressive you can be in the code that you write, how fluent you are, um, in, and how, how, um, how the syntax that you write helps you get your work done. 
We also want to talk about how tidy models will make you more effective. What we mean by effective here is um, that it allows you as a a practical modeling practitioner to have access to a wide swath of different kinds of approaches, that it enables you to do many different kinds of things. And last, we want to talk to you about how Tidy Models keeps you safe. The process of machine learning has many pitfalls or um, you know, potholes in the road on the way, if you will. And what tidy, tidy Models is designed to help you avoid those pitfalls, those potholes. So uh, Max, let's start with talking about um, being more ergonomic. What, um, how, do you think, how do you think about being ergonomic when it comes to modeling? So a lot of times I think about like physical ergonomics. Like when I worked in diagnostics, we'd have people come in with clinicians and they would interact with the diagnostic machines we had and we'd watch them and see like just as they did their work, like what were things they did over and over again or they might get frustrated with. And, and there's a lot of that in the syntax, the, the way we design syntax for our functions. But in particular in machine learning, there's like an extra layer of things that we have to think about because there's a high amount of cognitive load for machine learning. So when you go to do a model for the first time, or if you're, let's say, taking a workshop to learn about machine learning, before you can even get to your first model fit, there's all this stuff that we have to throw at you. We have to talk about overfitting and data splitting and training and test sets. And there's a lot of jargon and a lot of things. It's like you do this and then this and then this, and then you know a day or two later, maybe you're fitting your, your first model. And so what we want to do is we want to simplify this process, maybe in ways you don't even see in terms of the syntax. Um, so, you know, we want to take this complexity and reduce it down a little bit. We don't want to stop you from, like, doing really sophisticated things and having access to, like, the functions and the nitty-gritty bits. But we do want to give you really good APIs that for, like, 80% of the work, the syntax should be pretty high level and consumable by just about anybody. So one aspect of like machine learning and really complicated or sophisticated statistical models is we have to think about what our data are and how we're going to use them. So we're going to do our first Slido poll. So go ahead to slido.com if you haven't already, and the key or the event code is our keynote. And so what we want to talk about is the types of roles you would have when you're, when you're building models. And so this is multiple choice, so like A and B are the things that we probably think about normally, predictors and outcomes. But you know, there are more sophisticated methods you might use like with case weights, like frequency weights or importance weights or survey weights. Um, in some cases, you might be modeling and you have like stratification variables. Have you ever used those? Um, things like censoring indicators. So Hannah Frick will be talking about um, our code or our package for survival analysis. If you've ever used that, like choose this on the quiz. And then there's some old school things like offsets uh, for Poisson data and things like that. So the point is like, you know, we're normally thinking about things in a pretty simplistic way, but once we get more and more sophisticated in the types of models we want to fit and the types of problems that we have, it actually gets more complex. And we want to make sure that complexity for you doesn't get overwhelming as we work with tidy models. So let's look at recipes for a minute. So we'll use that as an example. So what recipes are is are kind of a combination of like the R formula method that you see in, in modeling functions, uh, sort of combined with like a dplyr sort of approach where you're going to be um, basically piping in operations that you want to do to your data before you get it to the model. So in the first line there, we load, the, we load the tidy models package, which again loads the core tidy models packages plus some tidyverse packages. And when you start modeling, um, a lot of the things that we typically do is we do an initial split of our data into testing and training set. So that second line is just taking our data set that's in a Spotify data frame and then converting that to an object that has all the indicators for you know, row 7 goes in training, row 10 goes in uh, testing, and so on. And so when you want to access the training set, if you look at the right-hand side of the third line, you'll see that we can run a function called training on that split object, and that will return the data frame that corresponds to the training set. So in that first line, what we're doing is we're starting a recipe. And there's a formula method there. It says um, popularity till dot. The left-hand side says popularity is an outcome. That's its role in the analysis. And the dot means everything else that's in that data frame besides popularity should be, by default, considered to be a predictor. Now, you can have a lot of different roles in recipes. You can make up roles for whatever you want. But right now, at this point, all the recipe does is it sort of catalogs the data, what's in the data frame, is it numeric, is it date, is it categorical, that sort of thing. And then it assigns it like a basic role for the analysis. So what we can do then is, as we want to do operations on our data to prepare it for modeling, we can sort of pipe in new steps, new um, functions that represent data processing steps in our recipe. 
So let's say we're going to use a model like a neural network or a nearest neighbor model where we have to make sure that our predictors are all in the same units. And one common way of doing that is centering and scaling your data. So a step function we have for that is called step normalize. And after step normalize, you can use any sort of like dplyr selectors like you would in the dplyr select function to say which variable should be affected by this. You can use contains and starts with, or you could just list the actual variables like unquoted. But we know from the modeling standpoint, when we make choices about these things, we're thinking about what type of role the variable is and what its type is. You wouldn't go and try to center and scale like categorical data. So what we've done is we've given uh, recipes a lot of X or D plier selectors to let you choose the model related context in which you want to use variables. So you see that all nominal, or I'm sorry, all numeric predictors, and it's doing what you think. It's going to select anything at that point that exists in the recipe that is numeric and has a role of predictor. So when we think about the complexity of how we work with and handle data, you know, we're adding a lot of like bells and whistles that are like quite literal that will make your use of uh, recipes and more complicated functions go a, a lot easier. So when we go back to our, uh, what I keep calling the Franken script, you know, we have all these things that we wanted to do to our data before we give it to the model. And it's, and it's kind of like I said, a big mess of scripts. You know, parts of these scripts have probably never been like unit tested and things like that. It's just stuff that you've had along for the ride for, you know, a few years. And so we can convert that into a recipe. So in that yellow box, you see a series of steps and they do all the things that we talked about doing. Um, you might use the um, uh, step date to take the date field that's in there and convert that to uh, new features for like date and year and things like that. The step after that is the step that we have that is good for parsing multiple choice columns that are text. So we get all the genres, make all the indicator variables for them, which is quite a lot. But you know, at the end of that, you might think you have too many variables to put in your model. So you might want to do some sort of unsupervised feature filter to get rid of redundant predictors. You might have like two genres that kind of do the same thing. They're almost identical. And so the step below that, step core, is one that can actually remove predictors in case their collinearity or their, their pairwise correlations are too high. So all these things you can put into a single object. You can save that object. You can carry it around. It's not in a bunch of scripts. It's been unit tested and um, it has a lot of features in it. So we want to simplify that part of the process. So the last three lines on the, on the yellow block, we do something like we create what's called a workflow object. And that's a situation where you want to take a, a complicated preprocessor like a recipe and bind it together to whatever type of model that you want to use. And in this case, we're going to use a machine learning model called Cubist. It's a, like a very um, sophisticated rule-based model. So in that workflow call, I'm binding together my data processing recipe, and I'm saying we're going to use this with Cubist. And then there's a simple fit function we use after that, and that does all the pre-processing, all the estimation that happens during pre-processing for this recipe, hands the data off to Cubist, it runs all its model, and it's all sitting in, in one object that you can save or deploy, uh, spoiler alert, and, um, and do your things with. And so that last like blue block is that one line for predict that we'd, we'd like to be able to do, and it does all the same things for your new data. So we want to try to simplify this process as much as possible. I mean, that recipe is not terribly simple, but it's also a very like um, predictable, tested, reliable uh, way to encapsulate your pre-processing. So you know, when we think about ergonomics, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. We want to do like potentially very simple or potentially very sophisticated things with a really nice API that we think you'll enjoy working with. However, there maybe are parts of the modeling development process that maybe aren't so ergonomic. So anything you would like to mention about that, Julie? Yeah. In, in my experience and talking with folks about their modeling, one of the parts of the whole modeling analysis that has been the least ergonomic, that has involved the most pain, is the process of getting your model off your machine. You know, you, you would spend time uh, training, tuning, developing um, a, a beautiful, accurate, appropriate model. And then when it's time to, um, to deploy that model, to put that model into production, um, there has been a real lack of tools for um, people who are excellent model developers to be, able to, um, to be able to take that model and get it off where it needs to go. Let's, um, let's do another poll here together, and let's take this time to reflect a little bit on what your experience has been like. If you, if you have deployed a model to production, think about what has, been, what, has, what has gone well, 
what has been the what have been the pain points? Whether that's um, the the code that you needed to write that was awkward, or the collaboration between you and software engineers or IT folks in your organization. If you haven't deployed a model to production, um, reflect on why that is. Is that because it it really isn't part of your job? Like you don't need to in your organization. Or is it because there have been barriers? There, um, there are, you, maybe you didn't know how, or maybe it was difficult to collaborate within your organization to get your model where it needs to go. Maybe some of you, are you're sitting here and you're like, what, what does that even mean, the word production? Um, that's a great question because there isn't some industry standard definition for what production means. I like to use the, the, the uh, definition or the idea that putting a model into production is taking your trained model, getting it out of the computational environment where you trained it, and putting it somewhere where it is useful to a wider um, group of people. So by that definition, taking a model and putting it in a shiny app and letting people interact to get predictions, you know, we could say that's production. Um, the industry standard uh, these days for model, putting models into production for model deployment is to create RESTful APIs so that you, have, you can scale your API, you can have it as a microservice, and we have this convenient way to take a model that you have trained and put it in a computational environment where it's accessible to anyone in your organization who needs it. I've been working on a, a new framework for model deployment and other MLOps tasks called Vetiver. So if you are into perfumery or fancy candles, um, like, like I am, um, you may have seen this word, this word vetiver. So vetiver is a stabilizing ingredient in perfume. It takes the more volatile fragrances and it stabilizes them. So in this metaphor, your model is this vo more volatile thing. You have used different hyperparameters. You have used different data. And Vetiver helps you stabilize it so you can version it, deploy it, and monitor it. Let's walk through that a little, a little briefly. So any modeling process starts with you collecting data, having access to some kind of data. The first thing you need to do is to understand, um, clean, you need to engage in the process of exploratory data analysis. There are great tools in Python and R for you to um, approach those tasks. Next, you want to um, uh, train your model. You want to train, tune, evaluate. And again, there are amazing open source tools like what we are talking about to be able to approach those kinds of tasks. So far, at this point, that becomes less true as we move around this cycle. Once your model is trained, you need to have a uh, a reliable scheme to version that model so that you can know which version of my model was used at over which time with each, each data. Once your model is versioned, you need to deploy it. And after it's deployed, your job is not done. You need to also monitor your model. You need to um, measure regularly the statistical um, the statistical uh, characteristics of how your model is performing so that you can make adjustments, decide to retrain, um, uh, head down that path. So the, the tasks on the, um, the, the right side of this diagram are ones that there are great open source tools for. The tasks on the left side are ones where that has not been true. And this is where Vetiver sits. So Vetiver is a framework for versioning, deploying, and monitoring your model. <clears throat> now, you can probably guess from this slide that Vetiver is not just for tidy models. It supports many kinds of models in R. And Vetiver is not just for R. Vetiver was designed from the beginning to have feature parity between R and Python. You can use the tools that you want to use to understand and clean your data, to uh, train your model, and then Vetiver can su support these MLOps tasks for both Python and R. If you want to learn more about what MLOps is, 
um, and uh, how vetiver works, with a, specifically with a Python flavor, I invite you to come to the talk of my coworker, Isabel Zimmerman, which is in the next session about MLOps and vetiver. While you're here, though, I'll just show you what this looks like in R a little bit. So um, let's say I, I trained that model that Max talked about, and now it's time to deploy it. The first step is to create a deployable model object. This collects all the information that we need to be able to move this model from where I trained it over to a new computational environment where I can make predictions. This information includes the, um, the, the types and number and names of the predictors, the original predictors. This includes also the packages and package versions, the specific software that is needed to be installed over in that other place to be able to make predictions. Once we have that deployable model object, the process of um, spinning up an API is, is quite ergonomic. This was our goal here. So on the R side, we use the plumber package. And once you have a plumber router initialized, it is literally just one line of code to spin up your model-aware API that's ready to, make, uh, to, to serve predictions at an endpoint. So this is what we mean by ergonomic. We want to let you be expressive, to let you be fluent, to let you get your job done um, in this way. Now, let's move on to our second point, which is um, how tidy models makes you more effective. Um, Max, what, when we think about this, like being effective, what are some of the things that come to mind for you? So, you know, uh, back when I used to do modeling for a living, I, I feel like I was most effective when somebody brought some data to me, um, like Denovo, like a new project, and I was able to give them a, a predictive model back that really like met or exceeded what they were interested in or what they needed for the problem, and not take, let's say, like months to be able to do that. So for me, effective is you know being able to produce uh, a performant model um, for you know whatever the context is or whatever the requirements are for the project, and do that pretty efficiently. So you know what we'll talk about in a minute are some um, some it's sort of like advanced tools that we can give you to help do that. Some are about performance, some are about efficiency. Um, a big part of building a machine learning model is model tuning, which we mentioned earlier, where you have these uh, hyperparameters that you can't directly estimate from the data, and you need to find a way to tune them. So another poll here: um, Have you ever tuned a model? So, for example, um, if you have a neural network and you want to figure out how many hidden units or hidden layers you should have, um, you need to you know, do some sort of methodology to uh, figure out what, a good, um, what good values are for those tuning parameters. So have you never done that? Um, yes, and I don't want to ever do it again sort of situation. Uh, maybe you did it and it worked well, or you do it all the time and it was easy, or you're a pro. So we definitely want to get feedback from you. We don't get the feedback from the, the slider polls as we do them, but honestly, for this and the next one, I'm kind of dying to see what your responses are. So go ahead and uh, let us know what you think about that. So just as an example of some techniques to talk about effectiveness, um, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't like bleeding edge, but they're relatively cutting edge and might be coming from different parts of literature. Some things we include in tiny models are from the deep learning literature. There's actually some interesting things we're doing from the computational chemistry literature that we're using for other types of data or any type of data. Some examples of that would be uh, feature embedding methods. And these are just like really fancy machine learning methods for dimensionality reduction. So UMAP and ISOMAP, like multidimensional scaling, are pretty powerful and interesting methods, and we'd like you to be able to use them for any data and use them with any model. So we want to enable you to use those uh, pretty easily. Um, the effect encoding is that the type of methodology you might use like with the artist field in the Spotify data where you have a large number of values you need to find an efficient and practical way of doing that. Um, th you know, that's not a terribly sophisticated method, but if you were doing that before, you would have had to write a, a bunch of like other stuff in your script to do that uh, before and after modeling. And we'll talk about model tuning uh, just a little bit more. Um, Bayesian optimization is a tool that's you know, pretty, pretty common uh, in the deep learning or neural network side, but you can use that for anything. Um, there are a few packages in R that do that, but they're not really well integrated overall with all the types of models. So we provide you tuning methods for Bayesian optimization that you could use for your boosted tree or for a support vector machine or whatever you're going to do. And then racing is an example we'll look at in a little bit more detail. It's a way to do like really, really efficient grid search. So in grid search, you might come up with, uh, for your tuning parameters, you might come up with a number of different candidate 
like uh, values of those tuning parameters. So you might say, let's try seven hidden units and 12 hidden units and two and so on. But you predefine them. And the, the problem with grid starts sometimes is you don't know if some of those choices you made about the candidate parameters are any good until you're done with all the computations. And so what racing does is it's a dynamic way of doing that is as you start to do the model tuning, it's starting to look at the results as they happen and look at some tuning parameter combinations and say, oh, those are never gonna be the best. So it does some statistics that like estimate the probability that something will be the winner in this race. And, uh, and it lets you do things very efficiently. So in this little animation we have here, the y-axis is uh, 50 different model configurations for a machine learning model, and the x-axis is a measurement of performance. And so the blue dot, if you can see it there at, near the top, is the current winner during each re, um, resample that we're doing for our uh, uh, grid search. And as you can see, um, a lot of these candidate values got grayed out and were eliminated on the next step. So every time it does a resample, it's doing some analysis to figure out what's good and what's bad, and it gets rid of the, you know, the bad stuff. And so really quickly, after like, like eight or 10 resamples, you're down to just a handful of models out of 50. And in this particular case, um, of all the models you could have fit, you, you actually only end up fitting about 7% of them. And if you're working with parallel processing, that's like a, almost like a three-fold increase in efficiency. So it took you a third of the time it would have done with regular grid search. And if you weren't using parallel processing, it's, a, it's a, you know, nine times as fast as what you could have done with regular grid search. So these are examples of the types of things that we want to implement. Like we're giving you APIs for them that are pretty simple, let you control a lot of things, but it'll make it easier for you to go like further and faster with your modeling. This racing example is um, such a great one because it really highlights how Tidy Models is extensible. Um, the, the package that provides that infrastructure is, um, is not a core Tidy Models package, but uh, um, an extension package. So the, the metaphor that we can think about here together is, is one of Legos. So if you have one beautiful, Lego block here, we can admire it, look, um, look how well it's designed. But the reason why Legos are fun to play with is that you can put them together. And you can put them together in the way that meets your needs or fulfills your vision or is what it is that you want to, um, what it is that you want to build. And that is how Tidy Models works. We showed a, you know, a handful of hex stickers up before that were some core Tidy Models packages, but, um, and said, you know, this is Tidy Models. But if we ask the question, what else is Tidy Models, uh, there, there's a, another whole group of packages that are for more, more specialized tasks. Um, I'm just going to uh, run through the ones on the top there uh, briefly. Um, text recipes is a feature engineering extension package for text preprocessing, text feature engineering. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. And Tidy Models gives you great um, tools to make you effective in building uh, text models. The next one there is the censored package, which is for survival analysis. Our, our coworker Hannah is going to be giving a talk on that in the next session if you particularly work with survival analysis. The next one is interesting, Stacks, because it builds on top of the whole Tidy Models framework to actually take um, to take multiple different kinds of models and stack them together or ensemble them so that you can, you can get a, like, squeeze that last bit of performance out of your data that you have if that's something that is important in your particular use case. The last one up there is model time. And I want to highlight this because this one is a package that's not built by us who work on the Tidy Models team. It's actually built by a member of our community. So this is built by Matt Dancho, who is here somewhere today. And it highlights how Tidy Models is extensible, not bought just by us, but also by you. This is true whether you're interested in building some open source software for a new kind of model or a new kind of resampling. It's also true you know, just within your own organization. You can build, for example, a custom metric based on your company's KPIs and use that to optimize the models that, um, that you are training. Now, when we start talking about 
all these packages. Um, one of the things that we start to hear from people is a bit of discomfort with the fact that there are so many packages. How do I know which one does what? How do I find them? And we want to acknowledge that, that yeah, there, there is this little bit of a, um, of a learning process. And it's important to have tools in your, in your tool belt to be able to identify what functions come from what packages. Uh, however, we really want to emphasize that this modularity makes all of our lives better. It makes our lives better as maintainers of the packages, and it makes your lives better as users of the package. Smaller, more modular packages um, can be released more frequently with smaller changes. We can more quickly fix bugs. So it makes our lives quite a bit better. It makes your lives better directly, not only because we're doing a better job maintaining, but actually directly. And this is, I would say, most highlighted when we are talking about model deployment. Let's say we train the model using that racing method that Max um, shared with us. We don't need any of that racing infrastructure when we go to deploy our model. In fact, we don't need the tuning infrastructure at all. We need a subset of the modeling software that is required to make a prediction. Our packages being modular allows you to make um, smaller Docker images, have um, fa um, faster installation times, um, being able to have uh, more scalable models in production. So, so far, we've talked about how we can have a more ergonomic modeling process. We have talked about how we can make you more effective in the models that you build. And last, we want to talk about um, being safe, practicing safe machine learning. So Max, how, how does tidy models keep us safe? So the whole idea of safety in, in modeling, you might be like, well, what do you mean by safety um, or being safe? Um, it turns out with like, you know, complex machine learning models and, and especially complex data, it's possible for you to do something uh, horribly wrong and not really know it until a, a really inopportune time. And I, I've made this confession several times at different conferences and things like that, but you know, in my first job I had a project that was like three quarters of the total R&D budget. Um, you know, we were doing a bunch of sophisticated machine learning with like a large number of predictors, and uh, we thought we'd gotten it to a good point, and my boss came by and he's like, how's it look? And I'm like, accuracy's like, you know, like 90%. He's like, great. And, um, and then we got more samples in, and we missed them all. And we did a lot of soul searching in the days after that and figured out some methodology mistakes that we'd made that others make, just to be honest with you, quite often. Um, and once we figured that out and fixed it, we, we had more, um, more genuine estimates performance. So there are times in, in, in modeling where, especially if you're doing something complex, um, that you might accidentally fool yourself into believing you have something that's really good, but you have something that's actually not as good, and you won't figure that out until we get new data. And here's one of the reasons is going back to this part of our previous slides is, you know, we have all the modeling parts and those are pretty well understood how to validate them and how to assess them. But very often before we get to the model, we might do something either simple or something really complex to the data that involves something that's not like a deterministic like data cleaning operation. We might be doing some statistical estimation. Right, so remember you're talking about the effect encoding or uh, measuring the redundancies between predictors. And so it's really, really um, important in some cases that we handle that in the right way to make sure that our, our statistics that tell us how well our model is doing take into account the good and bad parts that might happen in that part of the system. So let's think about like our Spotify uh, script. We have all these genres, maybe we got rid of redundancy, but maybe we wanna refine that uh, feature set a little bit more before we give it to our uh, model. And let's say we want to do some like fancy supervised feature selection routine. So we might want to pick like the top 10 variables to give to the model and pick those 10 because they're the most influential for the outcome, like for popularity in this case. So that's like a, a, feature, a supervised feature selection technique. And so let's say in our Spotify data, we're going to do a tenfold cross-validation to validate our model, and we're going to use feature selection. So actually, how many times do you think we're going to run that feature selection? Um, are we going to run it once? Are we going to run it 10 times? Uh, we could run it 11 times. Or we could run it some fractional amount of time because it was taking so long that you just like hash, you know, you slam the escape key until it stopped after three iterations. Um, I, 
I want to see the results of these uh, later on today. And it's not like a trick question, but there's actually more than one of these uh, could be true. And I'll talk about that in a second. So, you know, here's the situation we're in is we have some data, we have a list of predictors. Um, we want to enact some sort of feature selection routine to filter out some of those predictors before we give it to our model. Let's just say for, the, for kicks, we're doing ordinary least squares with LM. And so that produces some sort of fitted model. And that red box there is basically the box that says, like, what am I estimating? What should I validate here? And, and the way we have the diagram here um, treats the feature selection bit as if it were sort of outside the model. So if I would ask most people, like, where are we modeling in this diagram, they would probably do uh, what we show and, and just circle the, the, the actual technical model part of the process. But in actuality, what you have to do is you have to do this. And uh, in this previous slide, this is what I did when I made that, that horrible mistake in my job, is I just selected the features once, put them into the model, and there's a big sort of like circular argument um, methodology-wise in doing that, and it gave me really bad results. What we want to do is this. So the answer to this is probably C, where for every one of those tenfold cross-validations, you do the feature selection over and over again. And that may seem like excessive or it may take a long time, but at the same time, you can't measure the effect of something that's not within your sort of validation system. If it's outside of it, um, it might give you bad answers. Um, so the answer is probably B, which is 10. But let's say uh, this model was really, really good and you liked it and compared to all the other things that you did, this is the one you want to take to production. You want to put it in vetiver and deploy it. Well, actually what you would end up doing is doing it an 11th time because to build the final model, you have to do the feature selection on the entire data set, hand that data over to, the, uh, to LM and run LM on the entire data set. So really the answer there is either B or C. Um, but it's highlighting that there are some pitfalls and gotchas that it's really easy for somebody like me who studied this in graduate school and did it for a living for a while that you could actually make these mistakes. And, um, and unfortunately, it happens quite a bit. So, you know, there's a, quite a few papers that talk about this and measure this, but there's one that just came out. Um, you know, we're bringing it up because their findings were maybe, like, not great. Um, so leakage in this context is data leakage, and it's really where you're using the wrong data at maybe the wrong time to do some sort of calculation. Right? So in my case, I was doing feature selection at the wrong time with, a, with data that maybe I shouldn't have been using. And so in this paper, what they do is they look at a lot of different um, publications, and you can tell based on their method sections what they were doing. There was a lot of situations where they're doing like the bad methodology. Um, and in Tiny Models, what we want to do is, whether people know it or not, is we sort of want to like silently sort of give you guardrails. Um, so if you follow the process of tidy models and use a tidy model syntax, it's very, very, very difficult to do the wrong thing. So just to give you an example of that, here's another recipe. We're going to use a, a, a recipe extension package written by somebody in the community called Recipe Selectors. And that has a recipe in it that will do like a, let's say like a random forest variable importance score across your predictors. And then you can select the top 10 or 15 or 30, whatever you want you think you should do. Um, of the most predictors and give that to, let's say, your, your linear regression model. But we don't really know how many we should pick. So if you look at that line there, um, uh, it has an argument called tune, or I'm sorry, uh, top P. So it's like, how many predictors should I retain? We give that a value of tune. And that value of tune marks it in tidy models as being something that we want to optimize. We want to tune that parameter. And so then we can take our new recipe that built on our previous Spotify recipe, put that in a workflow with a, a modeling function that says we're going to use just plain old linear regression, and um, we could use the tune grid function to do like a grid search to find a good value for how many of those predictors that we should use. And so this is how you would do the feature selection in tidy models. Now, the thing is, the way we've set up resampling and data splitting, the way we're combining our preprocessor with our model, it's nearly impossible if you did accidentally do the wrong thing here and inappropriately validate or uh, estimate things from your data. Okay, so we're really, um, without really saying that, we're sort of forcing that, um, that methodology for users. That idea of making it hard to do the wrong thing leads us to wanting to talk about um, one more metaphor here. Um, when we're here talking about like being on the road, um, uh, being on this journey as we, as we drive down, this may not be 100% resonant to those, to those of you who are visiting here from outside the United States, maybe where you live somewhere where you have excellent public <laughs> transportation, but I have always lived somewhere where I, I rely on a car, like I rely on a car to get around. 
And um, uh, the idea of locking my keys in my car is something that, um, that is kind of terrifying because it's, you're like, oh no, what do I do now? I'm stuck somewhere. So here together, let's, let's answer another poll. So um, when was the last time that you locked your keys in your car? Was it pretty recently? Was it a long time ago? Um, have, you, have you never done this? Um, Max, when was the last time you locked your keys in your car? I would pick D, about 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I would pick D too. It was like 10 or 15 years ago was the last time that I locked my keys in my car. And I wouldn't be surprised if a bunch of people here choose that they have never locked their keys in their car. And I don't think it's because they're that much more responsible or good at handling keys than we are, but rather that you're quite a bit younger than, than Max and I are. Because uh, the thing is, the car that I have now, it's really hard to lock my keys in my car now. My, the car itself is built in such a way that it protects against um, common failure modes. So this, I, this is how Tidy Models is built. It is built to protect you against these common pitfalls, potholes that, that are on your road to um, developing and deploying your model. So the idea of keys is, is um, like an immediately painful problem, and uh, that some problems that you run into in machine learning are like that. Um, one I might uh, suggest here would be the model deployment. You know, you're like, oh, it's I can't get it. It fails every time I try to like push it to wherever I'm going. There are other kinds of problems, though, that are not obvious until later. So the metaphor we might use here would be um, not filling your car up with gas and just driving along. And because you didn't make that choice at the last exit that had gas, you end up running out of gas later. Tidy Models also protects you against problems like that, that you make some decision during your modeling process, and it may not come to bite you until you're predicting on new data. So as we come up and, and start to wrap up here, we want to share a thought from my friend and co-author, um, Dave Robinson, who uh, started using Tidy Models about a year ago and wrote a blog post reflecting on his experience. So he said um, that you know, he, like us, sometimes hears some resistance to the idea of, uh, or how tidy models works, that it makes it, it makes it too easy. You know, people, you're not like really thinking about what it is that you're doing. But um, like Dave, we think this is entirely backwards. This is entirely backwards. We want to protect you as a modeling practitioner from making, um, uh, silent but bad choices so that you don't have to worry and stress about those things and you can focus on the scientific and statistical questions that are the reason why you're training a model in the first place. So Max, here we are. Um, what does this mean? Well, I think it means that we're at the point with tiny models where it's mature enough, um, the syntax is pretty much solid. Um, no like super major changes we're going to be doing any minute now that would affect users. Um, you may have noticed a flurry of CRAN submissions where we've revved everything to 1.0. So I think the message we want to get across to you is, you know, it's ready for your day-to-day -day work. Like if I were working in, in my previous job, I would be using this, you know, you know to, to finish projects and do things on time. Um, you know, it's at that point where we really feel confident that you can use it and depend on it in your day-to-day -day work. Now, that doesn't mean things like, yeah, the unit test passed, we're good, or it passes, you know, our command check or something like that. You know, we want to build a good system, we want you to be able to use it, and we want to make sure it works, but we also want you to learn it if you've never seen it before. We don't just want you to be like, you know, read the man page. So, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, what we did was we spent a lot of time, like, really writing a lot of good documentation. So, tidymodels.org is a website that has some really good um, content content on it. You can see there's a section there for getting started. There's a great sequence of articles that will introduce you to Tidy Models, show you how to use it. Um, there's a lot of articles about like if you want to have an example of like Bayesian optimization or bootstrapping to compute confidence intervals and things like that. That's all on tidymodels.org. There's quite a lot of content there. In addition to that, um, you may have seen the other night that Julie and I finished writing a book on Tidy Models from O'Reilly. Um, they should be printing them now. Hopefully we'll get copies in the next week or two. Um, the website's down there if you want to look at the book down version. Um, so, uh, so check that out. It's a really good way if you like longer form documentation um, to learn about type models. So we think it's not only ready for you, but we think we have lots and lots of good materials uh, publicly available for you to learn it and, um, and interact with it. 
So I think the last things we want to say are thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you if you're in the room. Thank you if you're remote. Uh, we appreciate you coming. We also want to thank our teams. So we want to thank the rest of the Tiny Models team, Simon, Hannah, Emil, and Davis. Uh, the Vetiver team is excellent, um, Michael and Isabel. It's great having people from a Python background. It's really like enriching our like perspectives on like how we do things in R and modeling and deployment in general. And then there's a lot of other people that have had like a really, really big impact on our work, whether it's through like helping us design software or giving us feedback or helping us make training materials. So we have a great, great team uh, inside of uh, uh, Posit and outside of Posit. See what I just did? Um, <laughs> The thing we really want to do also is to really, really thank all the people who have uh, contributed since this started in like 2017. So we just want to like call them out in our own sort of special way. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to wait for that. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Julia. Uh, we've now got time for some questions. And uh, remember, go to Slido if you want to ask your questions. I do not see any oh. questions there yet. So I will make a chit chat <laughs> with Julia and Max until some que OK, we're getting some questions rolling. And I'll still make a little, uh, little, little chit chat. One, one thing I forgot to mention in my intro is that uh, Max and Julia have a book, Tidy Modeling with R, coming out very soon with O'Reilly. Unfortunately, not in time to make it for this conference, but it should be out in the very near future. Yes. And of course, you can read it online for, for free. Yeah. Do you have any like iTunes albums coming out? To promote? <laughs> SoundCloud. Our SoundCloud. We'll just drop SoundCloud. our SoundCloud. Perfect. It's just yelling at our keyboards while we do programming. That's right. <laughs> OK, so first question. Are you planning to integrate tidy models with other data structures like time series or arrays for images, text, or video? I'll answer first, and then you can go. So one of the things that is especially applicable in in text data is uh, the, a characteristic of it is that it is really sparse. And so one thing that we have did, um, I've already integrated, is the ability to um, internally within that loop that we talked about, pass data as a sparse matrix to, um, to models that can handle it and thus tr uh, train, tune more effectively. So um, this is something that we definitely think about and are interested in doing more of. Do you want to add more on? survival analysis or? Yeah, so for time series, you know, we've mentioned Matt Dentro's work. He's here and has like a whole bunch of packages that handle that. You know, a lot of times what we work on is mostly governed about covered by like what we think what we know about and honestly I don't think any of us are like expert at time series. So Matt's stuff covers all of that I think really really well. Um, we're doing more with survival data. We'll be more widely integrated with uh, like Tune and things like that. Um, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, we're always on the lookout, especially for recipes in terms of like specialized things that we can do. Like I'm not making any promises, but I used to work with a lot of like spectrometry data, and I don't do that anymore. But in my mind, like that's the kind of data that would be great for like a, a recipes package, like specialized recipes for that type of data because they have like somewhat unique data structures and things they do to it. So I think as time goes on, you know, we we want to find packages that um, satisfy more niche not markets, but you know, niche set of users that would be like really, um, you know, our framework would be uh, do a really good job of, of capturing. So. Julia, could you comment on uh, how Vetifer compares and contrasts with MLflow? Sure. I would say that MLflow um, more highly prioritizes mod model development in having opinionated um, requirements on how you develop your model. It then um, does some similar things in that it provides a way uh, for you to deploy your model. One thing that is different about Vetiver is that it is more flexible in how you train your model, how you tune your model. If you've come from a more statistical background, uh, you're going to be more comfortable with uh, using your solid statistical approaches to training your model. And then what Vetiver does is it comes in at that point, once your model is trained. So I'd highlight that as a main difference between the approach of MLflow and the approach of Vetiver. Uh, Max, how, how would a newcomer kind of get started with, with tidy models? Or 
do you think this is something that's only suitable for seasoned data scientists? No, uh, it's definitely, I think, relevant for anybody. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit more verbose than things like Carrot. Like, you might end up writing uh, a few more lines of code, but uh, its simplicity, in a way, is a lot more, um, is a lot lower um, than, let's say, Carrot, because, you know, you don't have, you know, for the one thing you want to do, uh, you don't have, like, 75 options to sort through. So I think it's really good for um, newcomers, especially if you don't have, an, you know, we've shown, like, UMAP and racing and things like that. We don't want to make it seem like you can't just, like, fit your LM model to the whatever equivalent of, like, empty cards or something you have that's, like, not terribly complex. So, you know, you can use it for that. You can use it. Um, it's not necessarily, like, optimized for infer inferential models, but we have a lot of things that you can use for that. For example, like multi-level models, like hierarchical Bayesian models and mixed models, we have infrastructure for that. Um, it's a, it, you know, the, the scope of it is a lot wider than maybe what we demonstrated here. But yeah, it's, it's pretty much usable for like simple things for newcomers, and, um, and then it lets you do more and more as you go on. So definitely if you're new, um, I'd start off with like the get started part of uh, tinymodels.org. And, uh, and that'll probably do a good job of like sort of leveling you up there. Uh, for both of you, any plans to integrate tidy models with uh, causal inference? With what? Causal inference. Causal inference. Or casual inference. Yeah, maybe? yeah. <laughs> just casual. Just, just casual. casual. Yeah. This is actually something, you know, of all the workshops that we just had the two days, that's the one I would have liked to have gone to the most <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't teaching one. So I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll learn about it and then start. I don't know, what do you think? So I'd like to. Um, I was saying the same thing at the book signing. I, you know, oh, what workshop do you go to? And they, and they say, oh, causal interest. I'm like, are, are there slides on GitHub? <laughs> um, again, it's like, you know, that's the, the really great thing about this job is like if we don't, you know, if there's like a field that we're not really intimately acquainted with, we can take the time and learn that, right? And so like it's something I've always wanted to learn more about. I would very much like to. There's a lot of methods, especially on the, strangely on the machine learning side, that have like causal versions of certain models. So it, it definitely piques my interest. But I don't know much about it, but I could definitely see us doing that. Maybe not this year, but um, and also, you know, we have a uh, user survey that we make um, about once a year. So we put things on there and let people vote. We're not really bound to those results, but it really, in the past, has really drive um, some of our development. So that's also a way, if you want to um, suggest some things, um, to do it when we do the next user survey. I think that's all the time we have for questions now. If you have other questions, uh, do not ask them of Max, because he is leaving to get married now. <laughs>you can ask him on discord i'll check discord like tomorrow maybe <laughs> maybe so thanks max thanks julia and please enjoy the rest of the conference thank you